My name is Scott Litzman. I'm a program director at RPE, and this is a webinar on electricity transmission. This is a topic that we've been interested in for some time. And the purpose of this webinar is to convey how we've been thinking about this space, how we see transmission now, and to tell about a few areas that we've identified that could be potential RPE programs and projects going forward. What we're trying to get out of this is more engagement with the community. We'd like to discuss ideas with you. We encourage you to send us white papers. And if there are funding opportunity announcements in the future, we encourage you to submit applications in this space. Now, let's dive into some of the details. I'd like to start by acknowledging my colleagues, Max, Kathleen, and John, who've been helping me with this topic. Here are the main points. Increasing electricity transmission capacity in the US is going to help decarbonize our grid more quickly and at a lower cost. But transmission is a complex space. There are lots of technical and non-technical issues. RPE's focus it really is te technical. We're not looking to innovate in policy or the regulatory space. We're really going to talk about technology. And there are two areas that we've identified. One is HVDC networks, better converters and fault protection. And the other is superconducting transmission. And we're looking for new ideas. We're looking for ideas that have a large impact and ones that, that could stem from an initial modest budget. The average RBE project lasts for about three years and has maybe two to $3 million in project budget. And so for a grid scale topic, that's not a lot of money. And so one of the things I wanna emphasize up front is that we're looking to innovate in this space, but we have to acknowledge that we're doing it with um, a smaller budget than a lot of grid scale projects would have. We're also interested in potential entry markets other than transmission. We are interested in ideas that have um, applications to transmission, but maybe other areas as well. So for example, in superconducting transmission and cryogenics, a technology could be used to cool a transmission line, but it might have other cryogenic applications outside of transmission that could actually be earlier entry markets. And we're looking beyond what I call the, the brute force method. A lot of this could be, you know, if, if a developer is willing to write a check big enough, they could develop, you know, very large scale converters that take up a lot of space and are very expensive or they could develop a cooling system large enough to cool hundreds of kilometers of super, superconducting transmission lines. And so what we're really looking for are more innovative, more creative ideas to get around some of these scale issues, which I'll talk about more in just a moment. So transmission has many benefits. I've listed two studies here from groups like Vibrant Clean Energy and Grid Strategies and NREL, and they talk about benefits like new transmission capacity can save consumers hundreds of billions of dollars they can reduce CO2 emissions and help us decarbonize. The NREL seam study shows that more capacity between the Eastern and Western interconnection could have benefit cost ratios to up to nearly three. So there are lots of benefits in doing this, but there are challenges as well. And some of those challenges, you know, those benefits, they're there, but they're also spread out, whereas the costs are very concentrated. It requires a lot of coordination among federal and state stakeholders, and there's a lot of local opposition to these projects. This is something that was documented in a book, Superpower, by Russell Gold of the Wall Street Journal, who wrote about Clean Line and Michael Skelly and their attempts to develop um, several transmission lines and some of the obstacles they faced along the way. Now, more recently, people have been talking about potential solutions like undergrounding lines or utilizing existing right of way. For example, the Sioux Green project in the Midwest is doing an underground HVDC link along the rail line, and that project is moving forward. So there are some potential pathways, but there are definitely a lot of challenges when it comes to transmission. Another challenge is scale. And there's actually a few different elements of scale uh, that I wanna highlight briefly. So one is just size right now. So here's an HVDC converter station in Europe, and you can see it's a huge scale. It's a very expensive, it's a very large, footprint to develop this, this type of technology. And so one of the things that we're looking for are lower cost and um, smaller ways of doing something similar. On the superconducting transmission side, the largest, the longest line in the world is in Germany and it's one kilometer long and it requires four kilowatts of cooling capacity. Now, if we think about transmission lines that go, might go for hundreds of kilometers, um, that would be significantly longer than anything that's been done today and require much more cooling capacity. So to have impact in this space, we need to think of technologies that could get to these very, very large scales. But the other side of the scale issue is we also need to develop these projects, at least at RPE, um, with that model, modest initial budget that I talked about. So really we're looking for our ideas that could um, really have their risk reduced in an RPE project, but then show the pathway of scaling to these very large scales that I've shown here. So here's our vision. We wanna develop advanced transmission capacities 
transmission technologies that have a lot of benefits, including some of the public acceptance and right-of-way issues that I mentioned earlier. And there are two that we're thinking about. So one is HVDC networks. And this is really about moving HVDC from a point-to-point -point paradigm, which is today, to more of a network. And there's a few things that we need to make that happen. The first thing we do is we have to reduce the cost and size of those high voltage um, converters, like voltage source converters of VSCs. They need to be smaller, they need to be cheaper because the converter is a huge part of the overall cost, which is why they're point to point now, rather than networks. And we also need to improve how we protect those multi-terminal DC networks. The other area that we're interested in is superconducting super conducting transmission. And this is a topic that people have been thinking about for a long time. There's been a lot of promise, there's been a lot of hype, but there hasn't been a lot of development. And it's one of those areas where people um, at this point now are somewhat skeptical saying, yes, we recognize there's a lot of upside, but you know, given that the industry is very conservative, there's a lot of question about whether superconducting transmission um, will ever become um, a widespread technology. And we acknowledge that, uh, and we're trying to identify some of this technical risk and help reduce them. One of the ones that we're really interested in is in the cooling system, how we can make those cryogenics more reliable, more efficient, and also lower cost. So these are the two that I'm going to talk about in this webinar, starting with the networks. So here's the schematic of the US. The, the purple um, underlying lines are existing HVAC lines, and these green lines are notional HVDC lines. And here you can see largely the point-to-point -point configuration. So maybe you know a place in the Midwest with a large amount of wind power connecting to the East Coast. There's benefit in doing that. But there's even more benefit in moving to more of a network. So if we had an HVDC network, as more renewable installations came online, they would be able to tap into that network. It would also be able to help with faults. So in this instance, if there was a fault in a given line, a large load area like Chicago would still be connected to the rest of the network. And a network would also allow you to drop off power in different places along the way. So in the book Superpower, one of the things they identified was flyover issues where people um, in the middle of the country where transmission lines were passing through, felt like they weren't getting much benefit from it. So by having cheaper converters um, and more networks, it would allow you to drop off the power and spread the benefit of that low cost renewable energy over a larger area. So there's a lot of benefits in going to this network model, but what we really need to enable it are cheaper and smaller converters and improved fault protection. We have a few potential ideas about how to do that, but we're also looking to the community for, for your ideas as well. And so when it comes to HVDC converters, uh, one of the approaches that people are taking now are modular multi-level converters or MMCs, and there could be new ideas around MMC module design. So how do you make them smaller, cheaper, more efficient, more reliable, different ways of stacking them, um, and also showing that an HVDC converter can work up to hundreds of kilovolts by simulation testing because you know, we're not gonna be able to physically build a converter big enough uh, at least in an RBE project. And we're also interested in other ideas as well. So around wireless power transfer for gating supplies, power or fiber, different ways of powering auxiliary circuits. We're interested in cooling. So add voltage cooling fans or heat pines or other novel cooling approaches. And also materials and control strategies, particularly to help reduce capacitor size. The other thing we're also interested in are ultra-wide band gap materials. This is something that RB explored somewhat in the switches program, looking at materials like diamond or aluminum gallium um, nitride or even gallium oxide. Um, it's one that's had a lot of focus, but it's also one where the maturity is very low. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done in doping. There's still a lot to be done in substrates and growth of these materials. And so it's, uh, these materials could have potential benefits when it comes to blocking voltages, but it's still very immature technology. Uh, and so we're interested in this space, we're trying to understand whether or not it's suitable for RP at this time, given its relative immaturity. The other aspect of getting to HVDC networks is um, current and energy limiters. So right now, the state of the art is a hybrid breaker that has things like a, a blind commutation switch, an ultra fast disconnect, and make breakers with arrestors. What we're thinking about are advanced fault current limiters that have less damage to other devices upstream and downstream, and also that could reduce the number of semiconductors to have in the main breaker, thus reducing the overall cost of the system. And there are different approaches to thinking about this. It could be lower globally warm, warming potential gases like alternatives to SF6. That's something that my colleague Ishiki Zayai is particularly interested in. It could be variable inductors, impedance controllable devices, 
It could be high temperature superinducting fault current limiters, which I'll talk about more in a moment when I talk about superinducting um, systems, or mechanical actuation or different shaped electrodes. And it could also be control systems. I'll note that the RB breakers program is approaching, um, pursuing some ideas similar to this, albeit at medium voltages. So what we're talking about here is whether or not there are analogs to the breakers program that could be done at high voltage and have an impact in this space. So the other aspect I wanna talk about this is superinducting transmission. And again, I mentioned before, that I think there's been a lot of skepticism as to whether you know, a technology that's radically different than what's being deployed today would ever be implemented at scale. And the reason why people consider it is it has a huge amount of upside. So it has less resistive losses, it has higher transmission capacity, and also uh, reduces right of way. So just to show you schematically what this looks like, for a given amount of capacity, let's just say five or six gigawatts of capacity, this is how much right of way you would need for overhead HVDC, for buried HVDC, or for buried superconducting transmission. And you also notice that the voltage here is a lot lower. So by going to superconducting lines, we would have much smaller rights of way, so fewer land disturbance. We would have more capacity. We would have reduced converter costs because everything would be done in a much lower voltage. So there are lots of benefits in doing this, uh, but also a lot of challenges as well. And those are the challenges that we're interested in overcoming. So the white space that we've identified, a lot of it is around the cooling systems. So we're thinking about innovations in cryogenics to enable greater reliability, for example. How can you make a um, superconducting line have the same amount of reliability compared to a conventional transmission asset? Um, this could be things like reducing um, maintenance. It could be trying to reduce number of moving parts or non-wearing internal parts. Different ways, how do you have this, this um, cooling system be very reliable, but also have it be high efficiency and low cost. So how can we come up with designs that improve efficiency as a percentage of Carnot at a certain temperature, say 77K, and at a certain cost? And also how do you minimize the cryostat heat loss? How do you um, reduce um, degradation of the, of the vacuum? We're interested in technologies to enable modular systems. So again, I mentioned before in the, uh, the project in Germany, that's one kilometer. How would that scale up to hundreds of kilometers and still be very reliable? And then we're also interested in cables as well. So a lot of the focus here has been cryogenics. Um, that's the area that, we've, that we're most interested in right now. Um, the Department of Energy and others have spent a lot of time and funding looking at development of materials, about trying to come up with materials um, with optimal um, TC ranges. How do we improve the critical current density? How do we improve manufacturability? So those are still areas that we're, we're interested in ideas, but I will note that it's had a lot of attention already by this point. The other thing I want to say is that um, I've talked about one sort of cryogenic application, but there's a lot other. So if you look at this plot, which is temperature versus required cooling power, there are a lot of technologies on here that have energy implications. So fault current limiters, um, motors, generators, permanent magnets, fusion. There's a lot of different applications in which innovations in cryogenics could have a uh, big impact. And for example, my colleague, Peter DeBach, is interested in cryogenics more, more broadly for better conductors, or potentially aviation applications. And so I'm talking about one example here for superconducting transmission lines, but there's a lot of other cases where advances in cryogenics could have an impact on our energy system, and we are more broadly interested. Please don't take what I'm talking about today as saying this is the only aspect we're interested in because uh, it's broader than that. So in the end, where I want to summarize is saying that this is an important, but it's a very complicated space. The full-scale projects at you know full grid voltages, uh, they're very expensive, and we're interested in overcoming the scale issue. Both technologies that have the ability to scale to these uh, these large applications, but also ones that we could really explore and reduce the risk um, in an RPE size project. I've mentioned HVDC networks and superconducting transmission as two areas that we're particularly interested in. Uh, but we're open to other innovative ideas. Uh, just because I didn't mention it today doesn't mean that we're not interested. And again, this is really about conveying how we see the space and what we're looking for um, are ideas from the community. That's the end of the webinar. I hope it's been informative. Again, this is a space that we're very interested in. I presented some high-level ideas as to our, our interest in the space, but we're really looking for more details and more specific technical ideas. And again, we encourage you to engage with us on this topic. Thank you.